I ordered two things on Amazon to solve a big question. What's, that? What's the question? I ordered a chicken and an egg. We'll see which one comes first. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, my God. Everybody knows it was the rooster. So selfish. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So how are you guys doing? You guys. So we're in Jersey now? Utes. Utes. Uh, <laughs> how you Utes doing? I'm doing awesome. Cool. Awesomely. Amazingly. Was that a Jersey accent or you're just really bad at Boston? Always. <laughs> right? <laughs> Jersey's like a terrible Boston in accent. <laughs> oh, now the hate mail comes uh, Utes. Utes. Well, you know, like a proper English is like the only language in the world that doesn't have a plural for you. Huh. Except for colloquial, you know, you all, y'all and y'all, all y'all and, and use. Use. I mean, no. everybody use. uses them because we don't have a formal substitute. I think use is correct for plural of female sheep. It is, actually. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> oh, my God. And All that's right. the show. Thank you for showing up. Yeah, right. We are officially canceled. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> right. And we lost our two listeners. All right. Well, you guys remember last week, the second story was about uh, the new zip domains oh God, that are sparking yeah. debate among cybersecurity experts. And, Dwayne, you said what? I, I said, you know, it'd be great. It'd be great if, uh, you know, how when you open up a zip file... It can open up and it looks like it's in a web page. What if we were to exploit it so that you'd have a website that looks like it's actually unzipping, but in reality, it's just content of a web page? Well, it turns out somebody was listening because that's exactly <laughs> well, what Dwayne happened. was listening into himself. <laughs> right, right. Ah, it slipped out. Uh, yeah, that's what happens when you listen to this show. So clever file archiver in the browser phishing trick uses zip domains. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> this, this is really cool. So, okay. I'm, I, you know, listen, they did a good job listening to hear security this week. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what you can do with this particular, um, this is a framework that, that actually um, helps people exploit other people in this way. And where can they get it, Twain? You can get it at www. Uh, no, I'm not going to tell you that. Good Lord. It's criminal career advice. Yes, children, go out and register all of those .zip domains so that you can exploit your friends and family for money and Bitcoin. Hey, I, who's going to get porn.zip? I mean, oh my god! I, you know what? I I looked through the list. I was gonna I was gonna grab it. But yeah, there were actually a lot. Um, um, all right. I did look up nudepictures.zip was still out there when I looked last week. Wow, um, that was still there, and I, I almost snagged it. Almost snagged mm. it, but uh, didn't. all right. So anyway, uh, but anyways, so um, so what's neat about this is um, as we had highlighted last week, we had said, listen, if you have a a .zip because it's a top level domain now. Um, when you put it in platforms like Twitter or whatever, um, they automatically make it a hyperlink now. Right. Right. So when you click on it, it goes to the website. Well, if I have that website um, UI look exactly like an unzip UI, like WinRAR or 7-zip or whatever, mm. then you have no knowledge that you've gone to a website. You're literally, oh, it looks like my normal zip utility. Right. And you click on the files within. And sure enough, you're downloading and running things you should not be downloading or running. So, hmm. yeah, I love I love this attack. This is um, this is going to be fun for a while. Hours of entertainment for Dwayne. <laughs> right. Just let um, the stories roll in, and he'll just sit there and go. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. You if we could uh, retrospectively say we gave ha- hacker criminal advice, actually, we, I think we did last week. I think we did. We did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah look at that. Yeah. What's this? We you got a mouse in your pocket? I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> the dad jokes so, keep coming. <laughs> so this is how security this week influences the world. We give people the bad ideas to go do crimes, and then they happen, and we say, yes, we're famous. We're like writers for the show, Jack Ash. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right. Well, you know, that's just a fun thing. But you really got to be careful with these freaking new domains, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and be careful what you're clicking on. I mean, more and more, they're blurring the lines between, in this particular case, I mean, it's awesome. The, the way it looks, 
the website they show in this article, and we'll post the article, um, yep. it literally looks like WinRAR. It has like the uh, extract to, add, test, view all at the top like you normally would. It says evaluation yep. copy of WinRAR at the top. I mean, it's, they've mm-hmm. done a good job. Hell, I've never been able to get a web page, follow my bidding, and actually look like anything I wanted it to. So I'm, yeah. I'm impressed with the UI design, honestly. Yep. It's pretty crazy. Um, when you click on a file, it actually pops up a window that says "No threats found." Yeah, It'll go. <laughs> Woo! Thank God Just for in that. Case. Yeah. None found. Only one uh. planted. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. And then, of course, it doesn't help that Microsoft just put GZIP and TAR and all these things. Like, what is the impetus mm-hmm. over oh, that? I'm so just good. wondering what these collective companies are thinking. No idea. No idea. You know? It's fun to watch, though. The mayhem and chaos. Ease of use. Did you say ease of abuse? Is that what? No, sorry. <laughs> and I got to jump to this warning from in the same week, right? The top AI researchers and CEOs warn against risk of extinction in a 22-word statement at the same time that they put out the top-level zip domains and Windows includes RAR and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. Now they're all saying, hey, we got to be careful, otherwise... uh, you know, we we might uh, go extinct the because we're giving AI the ability to wipe us all out. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, so I have a different opinion. I, I think that it's worthwhile to pay attention to how this stuff develops. But I think we are far away from AI making a decision to take us out. Now, it's a different thing for a government to equip nuclear weapons with you know give ai nuclear weapons and say you should attack under these circumstances well that's that's just a program that's not artificial intelligence just a program so we need to differentiate from you know skynet becoming sentient and taking control and i believe we are far from that but we should still plan for it i agree too and so do all of these other scientists there they are also saying that this is not here today however Mm -hmm. we have to be careful and so i'm going to read the 22 word statement Mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I I, I definitely think we should think about it. We should be vigilant. Yeah, right. Absolutely. I just think it's really kind of ironic that the same week that they gave us tools to (laughs) really screw ourselves Mm -hmm. and screw each other, they... uh, Say these same companies came out with this um, yep. statement. Um, oh, by the way, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I think all n- nukes come with a warning label, don't they? I um, think so. I, you know, I, this, yeah. yeah. Nobody's able to read them on the way when they go off. This could get very hot. Do do not detonate on your lap. It might burn. <laughs> <laughs> Kill your cousin in case of use. Mm-hmm. You know that got dark. All right. Well, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I'm wow. sorry. I didn't mean to go Ooh. dark there, kids. This is a fun yeah. show. We yeah, only talk is. about fun hacks. Fun right? things, right. Yeah. Like Jimbo's. Jimbo. What the heck is the Jimbo's protocol you know, and why is it in the news? I, I love the fact that um, I think people now are just really trolling anybody. They just make up names for cryptocurrencies and protocols and whatever, and just everybody buys it. Um, but I have a new currency called Lose Your Money Now, and uh, you should all <laughs> invest in Lose Your Money Now. L-Y-M-N. <laughs> Lyman. Oh, jeez. Lyman coin. It, Lyman coin. Lose your money now. The Jimbo's protocol, uh, an arbitra- <coughs> arbitratum? Arbitrium? Arbitrium? Not easy for you to say. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Based Arbitrage. DeFi project has suffered a flash loan attack that resulted in a loss of more than 4,000 ETH. Um, which currently is $7.5 million worth of money. Holy Um, crud. Yeah. So uh, days after this protocol was released, um, uh, only three days actually after the protocol was released, it got attacked. Um, So, you know, good job on making sure that was secure. Uh, You know, and it... Hey, three whole days. I know, right? Well, and it surprises me that in three whole days, and I get it, with crypto, everybody's trying to make a quick buck, right? So as soon as a new protocol or a new coin or a new whatever gets released, everybody buys it up because they want to, you know, sell on the on the uptick. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and the problem here is they people adopted this this protocol so quickly. There was obviously at least seven million dollars, seven and a half million dollars in there when it was exploited. Mm. Yeah, uh, the, the advice here is. Don't do crypto, kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Friends don't let friends crypto. It is perhaps the the biggest uh, Ponzi scheme 
mm-hmm. and most expensive and most destructive Ponzi scheme the world has ever seen. Oh, yeah. If you're in at the top, you're great. You're golden. I think everybody's trying to get in at the top. Yeah. That's not how that works, though. It just doesn't work that way. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Let's take a quick break, and we'll come back with more foolishness. And we're back. This is Security This Week. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Dwayne LaFlotte. Woohoo! And that's Patrick Hines. Hello. And uh, he just waved. He waved. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to make security fun, kids. <laughs> yeah, fun with security. Or mean, whichever the case may be. <laughs> uh-huh. And what's more fun than a hack for your Android phone that can compromise the fingerprint sensor? Oh. That is a good one. Yeah. I always thought those things were... Stupid. What the fingerprint sensors? Yeah, uh, they can be cool, I guess. Um, and and some of them are hard to bypass, I suppose. In this particular case, um, I don't know. <laughs> this is actually really kind of cool. I actually like this this attack okay. quite a bit. Um, so uh, we'll read the attack here. Uh, Brute print attack can unlock Android phones by compromising the fingerprint scanner. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Unless you have an Android phone. This is, it's neat because, listen, we've we've done a lot of work with trying to bypass um, fingerprint scanners as well as, um, you know, uh, Patrick and I are patent holders on a on a storage device that uses fingerprint scanners. So we're, we're intimately yeah. knowledgeable about a lot of the, the sort of exploits that can happen on a fingerprint scanner. Um, this one uh, uses some terms I've never heard before as a, a reverse engineer. Like we always talk about... Um, like heap grooming and stack overflows we talk about use after free like there's there's certain terminologies we use in exploitation um this one is a cancel after match fail camp and a match after lock mal um but what they're what they're in essence saying is with when you try and log into one of these Android devices, um, and if you log in improperly with the wrong credentials, whatever it may be, multiple times it locks the device out. Sometimes it even wipes the device. Um, and a lot of times, what happens is you go to log in once, um, and it won't. You know, it'll it'll say no, that was wrong. You try it again. No, that was wrong. You try it again. No, that's wrong. And then it starts to extend the time. So it'll yeah. say, oh well, now there's ten minutes between now and when you can try again, or an hour between now. So it's very hard to do a brute force attack. I can't just cycle as many fingerprints or, or numbers or whatever is what I want. It's a good approach. Yeah, it's a great approach. The, the thing to think about, though, is the fingerprint scanner, um, it's still a piece of hardware, right? It's hardware taking something, a fingerprint, and then translating that into a digital sort of uh, piece of data um, that then gets compared against a database of, of internal fingerprints. Well, if you were to crack open the phone, which is what they did here, um, you'll find that at the, the, the interface of the fingerprint scanner and the, the physical board mm-hmm. um, is a chip. Um, and, and this integrated chip, this IC, literally has points that you can connect to. Um, you know, in this diagram, we'll, we'll put the article in. Um, you'll see there's the MISO A and MISO S and, mm. and ground and VCC and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, whatever. For those of you that are like electrical engineers who do reversing all the time, all that means is it has actual serial interface that you can communicate with the chip itself. Um, so if you can communicate directly with the chip that's managing what the fingerprint scanner is doing, mm. you can do pretty much anything. Yeah, that's that's kind of what we think of when you know government when the FBI gets a phone and they want to get into it. Mm-hmm. We ex- we assume they're doing something where they're going to get in and short circuit something like that. So this is just an example of what we think of as a nation state level attack with physical custody of the phone. You know what I was just thinking is that you know I have an iPhone and it does face recognition, right? Yep. I wonder if I could take a video of of myself and then hold the phone up to the video and see if it nope. recognizes me. Yeah, it won't work. Um, so and why? In so in the iPhone sensors, um, iPhone actually. Least. So interestingly enough, um, the sensor at the top has infrared. Um, mm-hmm. You notice it can look, it can see your face even in mm-hmm. pitch black. So it's okay. using a, an infrared sensor, and it's also using um, a time of flight sensor to determine um, the three D contours of your face. Okay. Um, so it's picking up three D contours, sort of like the Connect used to do. Exactly. Yep. But think like um, a much more detail. Yeah. Um, so 
Could you get a mask of your face? Well, it wouldn't have the same infrared signal. Although I can tell you, um, I have an identical twin brother and he can unlock my phone with his face. So it's not, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. But okay, what if you, all right, what if you got a, what if you got pictures on the internet of somebody mm -hmm. and then you had a 3D model of their head <laughs> made? It'd have to be warm and fleshy. And uh, now we're getting into weird territory. What? It, it detects heat too? Well, it's infrared. I think we're in weird territory. Right. So it, I think if you just had a cold mask, the infrared wouldn't reflect off the way it would somebody who's 98.6 wow. degrees, right? Well, yeah. it, it, it'd have to be a very thin mask or But what about, you know, right some way. sort of dummy, right? right? Some sort of head. <laughs> right. A, a, a hundred degree <laughs> dummy. What did you call me? You heard me. With somebody's face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it again. Uh, but no, interestingly, interestingly enough, um, so re you'll remember with um, yeah. Windows Hello, um, there was the, you right. could use a camera, right? right. You use your webcam to unlock it. And the webcams yeah, don't use infrared technology. They don't have it built in. So there was a period of time um, where with if you had used Windows, the Windows Hello yeah. to log in with your camera, you wow. could print someone's face out and put it in front of it and it would unlock the screen. But this is the next um, evolution. Yeah. Part of the arms race. Well, and with cameras, they've done some different things now so that you can still unlock with your face, but um, they're much better at detecting whether it's flat, a flat image or not. All right. So what are the chances that somebody's Android phone is going to be compromised uh, with this brute print attack? Zero. I... Yeah, I, honestly, and that's that's a great thing to talk about because this this seems like a lot of hype. Oh my God, you can buy a fingerprint scanner, and really, somebody has to take your phone, crack it open, solder um, to the the uh, fingerprint scanning chip um, some leads. I mean, they could use clamps or whatnot, but um, and then have an external board, an operating board that okay. does all of the brute forcing. It's not this isn't an easy process, but. But, you know, if a criminal really wanted to get into somebody's phone and they stole it and they brought it back to the lab, they could do all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Nation state level hacking, you know, syndicate, hacking syndicate. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah. They're going to get in. It just yep. means that that's, that's mm. a, a way for them to get in. There's yeah. always been ways for them to get in. With physical access, the, the scary thing here is that they could potentially, if the phone's still connect, still on, hasn't been shut down, they can get active memory they can they'll they'll get you know they'll get your data so technically if i could get the right phone i could get into their authenticator app and bypass right. all your two-factor authentication mm -hmm. yep. so this will be the topic of the next um <laughs> i don't know action thriller or next week's show you know when it oh my god yeah starring right st starring whoever the next action hero is somebody figures out how to do it and right yeah all right um, now, just so you know, um, everything from the ga the Galaxy S10, the OnePlus 7 Pro, um, the My 11 Ultra, they were able to unlock all of them within wow. about 40 minutes of brute yeah. forcing. So that's pretty quick. Um, the iPhone, however, iPhone SE and iPhone 7, they were susceptible to part mm. of the attack here, but not the full attack. Um, so it did give them the ability to yeah. try like 15 fingerprints. Um, but not enough really to brute force. So I experienced uh, iOS Apple security in a very real way in the last couple of weeks. Um, I set off to... Were you thrown uh, out of the store, the Apple store? <laughs> I was... <laughs> <laughs> Again. Uh, right. I wish I could claim that, but no. Um, so I was I, w I set off to write a background service and... Uh, and I did it in Android because it was so easy. And looking at the process of doing something that runs in the background consistently and uh, accepts, you know, for phone notifications and stuff like that, you have to jump through a whole lot of hoops in iOS in order to get that to happen. But in Android, you just connect it with a USB, you know, deploy the app to your phone, boom, it's running and it's there. Um, yeah. and it just in general, yeah. if you're going to do any programming against an Android device, it's, it's that easy. But if you're going to do any programming against an oh, iOS yeah. device, you, first of all, have to pay $99 a month to Apple and I'm sorry, $99 mm -hmm. a year, I think to be in their program. 
And then mm, I think it depends on the level. I think the entry level of programs is a year. More than zero. It's more than zero. Yeah. Yeah, it's more than zero. So there's a cost involved. And then you have to register every device that you're going to develop with, with them. Mm-hmm. Anything that you're going to copy some code from your computer onto an iPhone has to be registered. Provisioned is what they call it. Mm-hmm. And that process is involved, you know, it involves a certificate and all that stuff and then connected to your computer and blah, blah, blah. And every time you want to just connect to it, you you have to get that certificate and check phone home with Apple like it's it's secure. So, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And a very inconvenient, Patrick. Yes. Right. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, it definitely goes to show like um, Apple is really good about not only managing their own devices, but um, mm-hmm. managing the ecosystem around the security of their devices, you know, culling the store as much as possible, making sure that like, are you going to pay money to us to right. actually be able to develop the apps? And are you going to, you're going to provision right. only a couple phones? Um, yeah, they've, they've definitely put it, I mean, and, and you got to, from Apple's standpoint, it takes sure. more time and money on their side, right? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Whereas Android's like, whatever, it's open source, go figure it out. But it lowers the reputational risk. We saw this with Microsoft yeah. with yep. the um, the login features mm-hmm. for their .NET framework. When they first released .NET, they're like, yeah, just right. follow best practices. And as, as apps were released that were insecure, mm-hmm. Microsoft took blame, even though yeah. they didn't write it. And they didn't really have any blame, but they didn't provide the tools. Apple's learned that lesson, and they're they're doing very everything they can, which is good to make it hard for their platform to be um, considered unsecure. Yeah. So, so the end result though, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, Android is a more popular platform among phone users. There are more Android phones out there than any other kind of phone. However, the Android uh, users like to get things for free and don't typically don't like to pay for things. Whereas I think the the Apple is like the one percent, you know, like the elites. Uh, they they like their Apple products and they pay dearly for them. But you know, as as we were just saying, the you know it's a more secure experience. It's probably uh, therefore a, a better experience for battery life and for all of those things because Apple has so much control over it. We're not saying that Apple is totally no. like invulnerable, but it is it is a better. It's like uh you know those micro cars. Yeah. Coopers, Mini Coopers. I'd rather get in an accident with a, a Humvee yeah, than with one of those. I thought you were talking about micro machines. No. <laughs> so you'd rather be a murderer than a victim, I think is what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, yeah, I, I, think think so. I think so. I just want to make sure I know what you're saying, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, just putting you in the, yeah. yeah. Rather, rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. listeners were so. confused on <laughs> that, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they know All Patrick. Right. They see you. Just keep it up. Keep All it up, right, bro. Okay. My body count will go up by one. <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> now, if he dies yeah. in the next twenty-four hours, I'm really screwed. You're a suspect. Now, yeah. <laughs> right? So I just got to get to the editor. Uh, who wants this one? Barracuda Zero Day abused since 2022 to Ooh. drop new malware Ooh. and steal data. <laughs> go ahead, Dwayne. Ooh, Barracuda. <laughs> Ooh, I want this one. All right, yeah. <laughs> Barracuda. Um, so for those of you who haven't implemented a, you know, enterprise security email gateway, um, Barracuda is a device that gives you the ability to make sure that, um, emails that are coming and going, Mm -hmm. don't have malicious content, uh, aren't coming from shady places. Um, really kind of a, think of it like an email firewall, if you will. Um, so decent devices to have until they don't work very well. <laughs> um, so in this particular case, I mean, listen, if you have a Barracuda uh, email security gateway, go update it. Um, so that's going to be the moral okay. of the story here is patch. Uh, but CVE 2023-2868 um, is, it's an interesting exploit. Um, you know, it's it's funny. In the article we have from Bleeping Computer, it just says, hey, there's a way for somebody to kind of man- maliciously take over the entire Barracuda Gateway. And there are two back doors. Um, one's dubbed uh, Saltwater, and one is dubbed uh, Sea Spy. Eh, you know, attackers and their, their naming convention. At least it's in the fish metaphor. They're not very creative, are they? Right. I know. No. Um, so um, both of them give the attacker the ability to have remote control over the device and be able to oh, jump into the internal network. Okay. So that's kind of scary. Um but they also give you the ability to watch yeah. all coming and going emails. So they can, they can see everything that's coming and going off the network, which is, yeah, not a great thing. 
um, ballpark uh, 200,000 organizations are using these devices. Um, so pretty, pretty big uh, risk footprint. Um, if you dig into this uh, at NIST, so you say, okay, cool, I want to figure, well, <laughs> if you're like me, you say, okay, cool, I want to figure out how this works so I can use it. Um, but, you know, you dig into this at NIST, it says a remote code injection vulnerability um, exists in the Barracuda email security mm-hmm. uh, gateway appliance. Um, and you, you keep digging and it says it is because of a failure to comprehensively sanitize the processing of tar files. Tar files. Isn't that kind of a compressed file format? Yeah, it is. It is. So it's like a zip or a gun zip or whatever. Wait a minute. Didn't Windows just introduce tar? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they did. Fantastic, right? Let's hope they actually sanitize it properly. Timing is incredible here. Right? It's impeccable. So you, so you say, okay, somebody, okay, so somebody's probably sending an email to the gateway, and it has an attached yeah. tar file. And then in that tar file, according to the NIST report, it says, uh, blah, 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 particular, uh, if you send, if the remote attacker sends this formatted file, a tar file, in a particular manner, it will result in remote code execution and system commands through the Perl's QX operator. Perl, as in the language? P-E-R-L? Perl. Perl, yeah. So Perl is a text processing slash, yeah. you know, uh, programming language, scripting language, yeah. I used to write a lot of Perl. So apparently, um, the Barracudas natively have Perl. And, and for those of you who don't know what the QX operator is. That's everybody. Um, <laughs> One guy's going, not me, not me, I know, I know. Right? <laughs> so in Perl, um, for you to include other scripts and text and whatnot, you can use either the backticks, you know, yep. that little thing that's like right under the escape that nobody right. uses next to the tilde. You can use those or the QX operator. So the QX operator allows you to put in brackets a script you want to call. Um, so in this particular case, you think, okay, there's a tar file, and tar file is formatted in a way where it thinks it should process this file as a Perl script, and somebody's putting QX operator in there and then saying, call this system. Go to your command. browser and type Perl script.tar. Really kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so it's a, it's a neat exploit, but at this point, um, they yes, they would have complete control over the Barracuda device, be able to see mm. all coming and going emails. Um, and potentially uh, walk right into the network. Here's a historical fact for you. In the very early days of the World Wide Web, um, when we had Unix-based web servers, which is what they were all at the time, there was no Windows-based web servers Mm -hmm. until Internet Information Server came out. But um, before that, if you wanted to execute uh, programs on the back end, right? If you wanted to go beyond static HTML files and you wanted to, like, I don't know, have a form... Where, where you're gathering somebody's email name and address, you you, you had to use the CGI-bin. Oh, yeah, CGI-bin. And uh, that typically yep. would be to a Perl script that would collect data and uh, do all that stuff, yeah. There's Perl again. I love me the CGI-bin. Yeah. We still see it out there because a lot of web servers still have it configured. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, this is awesome. <laughs> places i can execute stuff and things so um yeah and now you can do some extra naughtiness with that little pearl hack awesome awesome all right barracuda so get it patched all right so let's get to our clickbait story amazon to pay over 30 million dollars in federal trade commission (gasps) settlements over ring which is their doorbell and alexa privacy violations yeah, so five point eight million of yeah. that is over Ring, and twenty five million of that is over Alexa, and they're all different suits. Yeah, I think this is and well, and it's privacy is becoming very privacy has been yeah. a hot topic for a long time, and it, it's being taken very seriously. Um, it's uh, it's been very serious in Europe and most of the world. It's still not prime time here in mm-hmm. America. I guess Americans seem to just realize that yeah. there is no such thing as privacy. Um, my understanding is that most of these are about employees' improper access to videos and, okay. and recordings and things like that, and, and things that go against. Now, uh, from what I understand, Amazon hasn't admitted that there was any actual right. fault. They just want to put this behind them by settling the lawsuits. Mm-hmm. It, this is going to be something that's going to come up over and over again. We're still figuring it out. We're still figuring out what's going on. The difference between 
valid use and invalid use. I, I'm not naive enough to think that my Ring video isn't viewable right. by somebody with as sufficient yeah. capabilities at Amazon. Um, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe eventually it'll it'll get to that. But that's a, probably the best assumption. I don't yeah. have any Ring cameras facing into my house or into right. onto any place that I you know yeah. would care about. Yeah, it's probably a best practice. No, it is, and and I think here the more the bigger concern is around um, filming children uh, as well, right? Coming and going out of the building and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, one of the lawsuits uh, is uh, Amazon violated the FTC Act uh, and Children's Online Privacy Act by illegally retaining thousands of children's information through their profiles on Alexa Voice Assistant. Amazon paid twenty five million dollars mm. in that suit. Um, but the, but in this particular case, um, they're saying that uh, Amazon would have to delete any video and data collected from individuals' faces, referred to as face embedding, that was obtained prior to 2018 okay. um, under this same act. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if this is more, hey, I don't want my child's face being used. Um, and, and, and more importantly, my child being recorded without me knowing, yeah. um, and then Amazon profiting off that. I, I noticed a little damage control on Amazon's part. Um, different, I use like every stream service known to man, like, cause they all have the different shows that I like to watch and yeah, I have to subscribe to all of them. So, yep. um, fortunately I can do that anyway. Uh, I, I noticed that their ads for ring Amazon ring. Uh, featuring people whose lives were saved because the neighbors came over and mm-hmm. said, you know, uh, yeah, somebody she fell and fall. had a heart attack, whatever. House is on fire. And somebody came over and rang the doorbell mm-hmm. and say, you know, your 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 guy just had a heart attack, whatever. And they're calling, you know, nine one one and on the phone with them with the parents or whatever. So yeah, that's uh, that's that's what they're doing. I I noticed this spin before this article came out. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So there's, there's I I, I use Ring in some one mm. of, you know some of the places that I um, okay. operate. How about that? Uh, and wow. And wow, that was that was weird, Patrick. It's used to like identify like uh, hey, there's a bear, yeah. a large bear, uh, in this area. And now I can understand. Okay, if I'm going to see a mm. bear, it's probably going to come from this direction. Mm. Uh, lost dogs, things like that. Um, lost you know animals it, it, it's kind of like that neighborhood dot yeah yeah next door yeah next door that's it, it it's yeah. got that kind of feature all technology has the ability to be abused sure so we just have to always approach it as if it's a loaded weapon and not point at our face i have a camera pointed at my hummingbird feeder and uh so far none of them have complained or filed suit not to you. <laughs> right? <laughs> you may be in the middle of a woodland court issue soon. Yeah. You know what's really fun, though? If you if you really fill up the hummingbird feeder with sugar water and let it sit out in the sun for a little while, it turns to alcohol. And then watch the fun begin. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there's nothing more uh, fun. When you yeah, see Carl drinking out of the feeder. Nothing says fun like drunk hummingbirds <laughs> in the middle of summer. Yeah. Until someone loses an eye. <laughs> uh, then it's just fun. That's why you wear the glasses. It's defense against hummingbirds. So uh, before we get Heck off yeah. this topic right. with Ring and, right. and all that stuff, I want to talk about the general safety of these devices like Nest. The Nest uh, thermostat was one of the first ones. Mm. And uh, I know Richard Campbell, our friend, said he has a Nest thermostat and it's connected to the internet and all that stuff. And then I started hearing about how that's, you know, how these are kind of insecure and I, I guess it comes back to how they connect to the internet. Like you, you guys told me that I should have a, my private Wi-Fi network where all my computers are on, and then a guest network that only has access to the internet and a separate internet access only uh, a point or network SSID just for devices. Is that is that a good yeah. idea? Is that is, is that the way to do it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And if. I, and if you had to get away with only two networks, um, like I would have a, I would have a network where, you know, all of my, you know, computers that we do banking mm-hmm. and that sort of stuff is on. And then my, my other network would be everything else, right? Yes, Thermostats, plus, cameras. Plus, right, but plus only uh, internet TVs. access. Yeah. 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 Correct. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah Cause it's rare. Like, listen, it, like in my house, I have a rack, I have a, a five foot rack yeah. with servers in it. 
like that's not a normal house, right? A normal house, you're not accessing a ton of resources locally, maybe a right. printer, but that's about it. And most people aren't sharing files from a server. They're not accessing services. They don't set up a web server in their own house. I have a voice over IP server at the house, yeah. like entirely different thing here. But in, I think in most environments, like my parents' house, for example, my parents' house, there's no reason for them to access any devices on the network if right. they just go directly out to the internet and that's pretty right. much okay. it. There's They're not sharing access, drives so. with that's, that's each other's computers and laptops and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, there you have it. Straight from Dwayne's mouth to your ears, to your pocketbook. Woohoo! I don't even know what that means. All right, guys. <laughs> we'll uh, talk to you next week. Okay. Thanks. Bye, guys. See you later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.